Welcome to tonight's event. Um, before we begin, I'd like to thank um, a few people, Bobby Bedral, Antonia, the BGA and the host German Society team for setting up this event. Um, especially now in this critical and uncertain times for the future of the British European relationship, it is a great honor and uh, privilege to welcome such uh, distinguished speakers this, uh, this evening. Um, so we are joined by David McAllister, Chair of the European Parliament, Foreign Affairs Committee and Chair of the European Parliament's UK Coordinating Group. Prior to um, his membership in the European Parliament, he served as Minister President of Lower Saxony in Germany. We also joined by Tom Tugendhat, a Member of Parliament and Chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee in the House of Commons. Before entering Parliament in 2015, Mr. Tugendhat had a very distinguished career in the British Army. Uh, we are also joined by Lord Kino. Um, since 2015, he sits in the House of Lords, and since 2019, he serves as chair of the European uh, Union Committee of the House of Lords. Last but not least, we are also joined by uh, Professor Schoenhardt Bailey, Fellow of the British Academy, Head of the LSE Department of Government, and Professor in, of Political Sciences. Um, her research focuses on political economy with a particular focus on Parliamentary Select Committee. Um, so it will be very interesting from uh, your perspective as well. Um, so yeah, without further ado, um, to you, Professor Shona Bailey. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I'm, I'm delighted to, to join this esteemed group tonight. And um, I, I don't think that the timing could be any better. I think this was perfectly timed. Uh, I think that there's quite a large audience joining us and I'm sure that everyone will be very eager to, uh, to get straight into things. And so with the introductions complete, um, what I will intend to do is give each of our, our guest speakers an opportunity to um, give their thoughts and predictions if they're very brave and risky. Um, and then we will have a little bit of discussion, but I'll limit that because I think we do have a lot of questions um, that I anticipate coming from students and, and other participants. So it's a short time and we'll want to take as many of those as possible. So to begin, um, I will turn it over to Tom Tukenhat and uh, we'll, we'll hear what words of wisdom you have to share, Tom. Thank you very much. Look, it's a, a pleasure to be with you this evening. And as uh, as you say, uh, Cheryl, it's, uh, what a night this is. Uh, we're, we're really coming down to the uh, to the final to the final five ten yard sprint uh, to the finish. And so it's it's great to be with uh, this uh, this great group this evening, and actually with uh, a very dear friend of mine, David McAllister, who uh, I'm not sure if he's going to admit that we're friends, but I'm going to. I'm going to admit it that uh, we've been friends for many years and it's it's a great pleasure to see him here today and of course with Charles my uh, uh, sort of opposite ish number in in the House of Lords it's um it does sort of slightly feel of course as if we're we're you know under the uh, under the microscope not just because uh, we're going to be asked to predict things that we're going to find out in a day or two whether or not they're true which normally we get a couple of years so, so we've got the chance that people have forgotten but Cheryl your area is uh, select committees and all three of us chair select committees and so uh, I, I sort of fear that we're going to be marked down at the end of this for our for our prediction so let's see let's see where we end up but look this is um this is one of those moments where it seems, because uh, to a certain extent it is, um, a moment of absolute uh, tension in the relationship between the United Kingdom and uh, Europe. And it sounds like it's one of those things that's going to frankly determine everything for a thousand years. And of course it's important, but let's not forget that pretty much all of UK history, and I use the term loosely to mean the history of these islands, as uh, otherwise the Earl of Canoole will quite rightly point out to me that the UK is a new construct, as in it's only 300 or so years old. Um, the, but the, in fact, David McAllister could point out the same thing, two Scots and an Englishman, there we go. And the, um, but the, the, pretty much the history of these islands over the last 3000 years is how do we deal with 
uh, our nearest neighbours uh, over the over the waters. And there are various times at which we've dealt with each other well uh, during the Roman period, for example, during many periods of the Anglo-Saxon reigns, we've dealt with each other extremely well. And in recent uh, years, we've dealt with each other exceptionally well. And in other parts, and you don't need me to go through uh, the history of the last two, three thousand years to see that you know, the Viking raids didn't end up quite so good for the English for quite a lot of the periods. And, uh, and there are various elements of tension in the past. So the question is not how will uh, these talks go in the immediate, but what will the shape of the relationship between our peoples and our islands be? in the coming 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And there I have to say, I am positive. Now, although there are clearly going to be difficulties and uh, as a member of parliament representing a community in Kent, I can tell you that there are some rather immediate difficulties um, arising from any interruption in commercial links. The reality is that the world is getting more globalized. The interaction between our peoples are much greater and therefore, the opportunity for greater cooperation really does exist, whatever the political constructs that go with it. You know, the reality is that uh, if you look at global trade, even with communities with which we haven't had uh, close trading arrangements, whether that's, uh, you know, in far parts of the world or indeed uh, amongst really good partners like the United States, the level of trade has increased hugely uh, because of achievements like the World Trade Organization, yes, but actually achievements like TransferWise, a fantastic Estonian invention uh, for cheap uh, exchange of currencies. So, you know, the amount, of, the amount of connection between our peoples has increased massively. So, however these talks go, and, you know, clearly I hope that they reach a successful conclusion. Um, the reality is I think there is a hugely positive uh, outcome uh, possible over the next uh, few years for our, for our communities. And, and I hope, to work with friends like David to make sure that they're as smooth as possible. Excellent. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very positive, optimistic uh, outlook. And uh, over to David. Yes, thank you. And first of all, thanks to all who made this possible. And it's once again a pleasure to talk to the German Society of the London School of Economics and Politics. I remember addressing <clears throat> a meeting once in London when I was still a minister president. Actually, I could underline more or less everything Tom Tugendhat just said. Um, you, Tom, you just said uh, this is about the perfect time we could reconvene. Well, I can say perhaps it's the most impossible time because while we are debating the future relations between the EU and the United Kingdom, perhaps while we're talking, there will be a final decision in the one way um, or uh, the other. But let me definitely agree with Tom Tugendhat that um, whatever happens, uh, the United Kingdom on the one hand and the European Union's member states on the other hand, especially Germany, should not turn their backs to each other. Um, Tom, I read your CV. You also have dual citizenship. So you're half French, half, uh, half British. I'm half German, half British. So we also at a personal level know how interconnected Europe was and uh, Europe is. I wish we would have had a result by now as regards the ongoing negotiations, but we're still not quite there yet. I guess uh, there well, might be another 24, perhaps 48 hours of drama. But since the European Council will meet in on the 9th and 10th of this week of December, and this has internally always been said, this will be the deadline of all deadlines. We all know now that latest on Wednesday, we will have a result. I still sincerely hope that we can find an agreement. An agreement would be beneficial for both sides. But of course, it has to be a good agreement. And a good agreement in negotiations is always an agreement which both sides can accept, where both sides see their own principles covered and the red lines which both sides have drawn have been um, respected. 
The European Parliament will have the final word in this whole matter. Let me let me just come in here. I, I think that we've lost the sound entirely for David McAllister. Um, so it's not just it's not just me. And I believe that Nicholas is working on that. Um, Maurice, is there any way that you can get a message to to David to let him know? For all those um, participants who are eagerly <laughs> awaiting David's words, just hang in there while we um, attempt to fix the uh, the audio. Um, I'm not sure that David's actually even hearing us either. No. Maurice? So he can't, right, okay. Um, while, while I have Maurice and Nicholas try to work things out with David, um, Charles, can you, would you mind taking over, although this seems terribly rude to be talking over David, um, I think for the sake of just trying to move along, Charles, if you're willing to, um, to begin, could, would you mind doing that? Yes, certainly. I, I, I feel sick as a parrot because um, actually I was very much enjoying what David was saying and I too uh, agreed wholly with what uh, Tom was saying. I, I speak as a hundred percent a Scot and you can see from my curtains that I'm actually isolating at home. Unfortunately at the moment I have no symptoms or anything but um, that is a necessity. I thought that um, really the, the first order of priority is to build back the relationship in various uh, important ways. Uh, there are many strands to a successful relationship between uh, liberal democracies and one strand is an intergovernmental strand, uh, one strand is an interparliamentary strand and as you'll be aware in the negotiations uh, there is now um, on both sides a desire to try and make that happen. And then there are obviously strands like cultural strands, uh, educational strands and research strands all of which need to be followed up. And the, uh, the, the, the divorce action between the UK and the EU has interrupted all those strands which would otherwise happen. So they have to be rebuilt or reconnected in some way as we no longer have the interactions that we would have had in the natural, uh, the natural way the EU functions. The second priority is the rebuilding of trust between the parties. And it has been already a great uh, source of pain for me that trust has been so destroyed and damaged uh, in, in the last four and a half years. It's something actually I've discussed often with, um, with David and I, I think, uh, hopefully he can hear me, but I think he feels the same. I think a good way of rebuilding that trust actually is through the joint committee. I hope there will be a, a second joint committee, um, maybe an expanded first one. Um, but I think that working together on common problems and particularly the Joint Committee in respect to the Northern Ireland Protocol, this is a common problem that we have, that we have to sort out, uh, uh, we have to make sure that Northern Ireland can function uh, all round together and I think that is a conduit for helping to rebuild trust quite apart from the other, uh, the other building out of the relationship. Thirdly, I thought that um, there's quite a lot of scope for diplomatic uh, cooperation. Um, things like sanctions are so much more powerful uh, when you have uh, all the countries, all the liberal democracies acting uh, in, in, a, in a common way together. And um, the, the leadership that had been offered by the United States might be on its way back. But um, it, it has been very much an EU-led thing in various interesting and very difficult topics in just recent years. Uh, diplomatic cooperation with sanctions and there is also the, 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 our seat at the UN and I think that uh, we should be very cooperative on that. And finally there is of course the um, all the future relationship stuff that hasn't been part of these discussions. I've mentioned foreign policy already but there's security and defence 
issues that I don't think have been part of the discussions. There's quite a bit on the services industry side, which is so important to the UK economy, 80% of our economy. And, um, uh, and actually the needs of business is something which we might come on to. I've, I've come from financial services world and many, many years uh, in the city. And so uh, I, I have some understanding of that. And uh, I think that the, we do need to, to think about that as future, future relationship stuff. It's all going to be very unglamorous indeed, but the media lights will be switched off and um, it will be actually for people such as Tom and David and myself to try and make sure that these things happen and that we do re-establish an effective relationship for the years going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. David, are you, are you back with us? Yes, yeah, sorry, I was obviously kicked out. Uh, whatever happened. Uh... So just to let you know, I think we only heard maybe the first two or three minutes, maybe of you. Uh, you, were, you were talking about you being a good agreement and the, the role of the European Parliament. So we missed quite a lot. Are you willing okay. to kind of well, redo I'll, or recap? Okay, I'll be brief. Um, I would say that uh, an agreement would be beneficial for both sides, but of course it has to be a good agreement and a good agreement has to be one which is fair and balanced mm -hmm. and which both sides can live with. Um, I sincerely hope that we can still get this um, done. Um, of course, the procedures are going to be very, very complicated. Um, already, there's not enough time, not sufficient time for um, the member states and the European Parliament to analyze uh, what exactly would be in this six, seven hundred page long um, uh, document. In the end, everything is boiling down to the three well-known uh, stumbling blocks, the leveling playing field, governance, and perhaps to a lesser degree, um, fisheries. Um, but whatever happens, as Tom Tugan had said, uh, the United Kingdom will remain our neighbor, our partner, an important ally. We will be interconnected politically in so many different fora in NATO, in the Council of Europe, in the OCE, United Nations, G7, G20, the UK and the European Union, vice versa, will remain important trading partners. And there are so many links between the 27 member states of the EU and the United Kingdom, and especially uh, Germany, that I think there's a lot we can build upon. Still, of course, it would be better if we can put our future relations on a solid legal basis. Um, and this will now all be decided in the next uh, 48 to uh, 72 um, hours. I'll perhaps um, leave it there, but just on a positive note to close that um, I have been, I've just read the, the, the statement of the UK government that Tom and Lord Kinnell, that they are willing to move on the internal market bill um, if uh, JC work makes uh, progress. So uh, that would be also a positive sign. Um, so Tom, the, the Prime Minister always said, let's get Brexit done. I wouldn't agree with that, but uh, let's get this agreement done. Uh, this is where I would uh, now agree as the best option of all we have in the moment. Thank you. Thank you to all three. And thanks to the audience for persevering with us while we dealt with a few audio-visual issues, but I think we're all back uh, in force now. I'll just kick off with, with some questions, but in the meantime, for those of you um, tuning in from home or wherever, uh, please, please put your questions in the chat and uh, we'll take as many as, as we can. So just to, to kind of kick this off, I mean, we're in this very odd space where it's almost like we're just in, in limbo. We were all in the waiting room and you know what's gonna happen in this very short term, um, 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours. And I'm just thinking and would urge um, all our, our panelists to think about way further down the road. So beyond 21, beyond 22, uh, the next 10 years, the next 20 years, the next 50 years, and kind of anticipating future historians, 
what would be your thinking in how history will judge the year, not just of 2020 and this global pandemic and the world having turned upside down, but indeed thinking about really the time frame from 2016 onward, leading us up to this period where we've had the growth of, of, of populist figures and populism more generally, which of course has played into, played into Brexit, but has obviously had a role elsewhere in, in the world and kind of just anticipating these, these huge events. Um, will COVID be sort of a blip on the map uh, and Brexit and the evolution between the UK and the EU be the overriding factor? And that's not a strange question to ask if you look at how many of us remember, well not remember, but for history books, the 1918 pandemic, not many. There are no memorials to that, hardly anyone there were no schools closed except when staff were, were gone. Um, it's, it's hardly even, you know, on the, the historical horizon. So just thinking down the road, what would be your evaluation of this incredibly momentous time, just you know, 2020, but also what has led up to this time? So any of the speakers. Tom? Uh, sure. Look, I mean, I, I think the comparison to the 1918 pandemic uh, is slightly uh, out of place for the simple reason that the 1918 pandemic saw a rise in deaths after four years of mass slaughter. And so it was uh, contextually rather different. Uh, and I'd also say that, um, you know, Britain's participation in the European Union has lasted slightly longer than the German Empire existed, but only slightly. Um, and so looking at how the UK works with Europe, and admittedly this is a change in that relationship and it is a big change, I don't deny either of those things, it's kind of like asking who remembers the Frankish Union? Not, not many people remember the Frankish Union anymore, but it was a very major uh, political economic enterprise of the 19th century. Uh, it didn't work, but it, but it was an attempt. Uh, and uh, a lot of people who at the time didn't remember the explosion of Krakatoa certainly lived with the after effects of it later. So I, I strongly suspect that we will we will remember the effects of COVID, if you like, you know, working from home, uh, changing employment patterns, changing uh, Zoom meetings, whatever it happens to be. The, the online nature, the acceleration to the online that we've seen this year, I think could it, in many ways be much more substantial uh, than a changing relationship uh, with uh, the European Union. Um, I hope very much, you know, despite the fact that, uh, you know, as uh, David quite rightly pointed out, I have a, a French mother, but as David may not know, I also have the right to an Austrian passport as my grandfather was stripped of his nationality under the Nuremberg laws. And uh, my uh, grandmother was entitled to an Irish passport. So there you go, there's another two. Uh, I could I could theoretically go for, I, I only say theoretically. Um, so, you know, I think the, re the reality of the interrelationship of people in the European, uh, on the European continent is greater uh, than the European Union and the potential changes that COVID has brought to our society could indeed be much more significant. Thank you. Thank you. David or Charles? Charles? Um, well, I, I think that's a very interesting set of questions. I, I, I am going to take it a slightly different way from Tom, not that I disagree with a word that he said at all, but um, I, I thought that when you look back as a historian, you'll look back at three phases of, of this. And the first phase is the phase leading up to the referendum, because I, I still think it's a great shame that um, we got into the position where um, where a referendum was thought to be necessary and then the referendum was was lost and um, or won depending on which side you're on but I, I feel that, that that will take a lot of analysis to see what happened there and um, and from that sort of analysis I think it's very important for everyone to, to learn a lot because um, UK was a pretty core part of the EU and for it to 
it to get so unhappy was oh, anyway things need to be learned so that's the first phase the second phase has been about the negotiations and the four and a half years we've had since then and that i think is a lot to do with the British constitutional stuff, because it's quite normal for a democratic parliament to get into a holding pattern, a sort of get, get hung up on an issue and not be able to decide it. And there always was a, 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 a constitutional way of getting out of it in that uh, you could just hold an election and then you've got another parliament. And if you didn't, if you still didn't get out of that, then you held another election. And there is a recent example in the UK of 1974, where we had two elections in a year in order to try and sort things out. And we, that was not available to us because we'd done some constitutional meddling in 2010 and, uh, and, got a, and done away with the ability to call an election. And I think that, um, uh, that we will look back and say, well, the trouble with the negotiation is we had no, no ability to actually present an agreement and sign up to it as a country. And that actually was damaging for us, obviously, but I don't think it was very helpful for the EU and um, don't forget this is our largest customer and um, and it's a repeat order customer it'll still be there and and we'll still be selling in a thousand years time stuff to the EU and they'll be selling stuff to us and um, so I think we we that's something for us to analyze and hopefully be done and then the third phase will be the build out from here and this is where we really do have to get it right. I, I described before a few of the things that I felt need to be addressed in some way, but I do hope there's enough energy left and there's enough trust left to get on with the build out and to, to build our way back to a successful relationship. And there are other precedents around. I'm, I'm, I look at the Canada USA relationship and that seems pretty good to me. And I hope we can, we can build out something which is, as David said, mutually, uh, beneficial for all 500 million plus people involved. Thank you. Excellent. Now, um, I'm a lawyer, not a historian. That's why uh, this is not my expertise, but um, I can imagine that, because you're asking what historians might say and write about these years, 2016 <clears throat> to 2020, in retrospective, what they might say what they might draw is that there are some interesting parallels between two countries in the world which begin with United, um, United Kingdom and the United States. Between 2016 and 2020, of course there were many differences, but you can say that in both countries the last few years were rather disruptive. A lot of changes happened and uh, in 2020 a lot are hoping in Europe that we can have a fresh new start in our relations with the United States on the one hand and a lot of us are hoping that we can have a fresh new start of our relations uh, with the United Kingdom and that's why we are working so hard until the very last minute to try and get a deal, respecting the British red lines on the one hand, but also respecting the principles we have to um, defend. And we want to organize a relationship with the British, which still keeps them close to us. And geography, history, culture, it's there, and it just won't go away. Um, because of a single political decision. What has been established over all these centuries will remain, so there's more to it. So that's the one thing I would like to say. And the second point is, you were asking about the future of populism. I can best talk about my own home country, Germany. What we're seeing in Germany is that now that times are so difficult, there is a new demand among the electorate for serious politicians. And since the Tambet pandemic came up as a problem, the so-called alternative for Germany, the Alternative for Deutschland, who are highly right-wing populistic uh, people, are going down in the polls. Because I think a lot of Germans understand, well, hang on a moment, these people are giving 
very simple answers to complicated questions. We're actually giving far too simple answers to very, very complicated questions. So perhaps 2020 might be the year where populism started to go down again in the Western world. And the events in the United States of America in November were perhaps also quite hopeful in this case. Thank you. So while, while we've had those great responses, we've had, we've had the questions building up. So, um, and, and you may be relieved that there are far less reaching questions. They're more in the here and now, uh, which may or may or may not be a good thing. So um, I'll, I'll list a few of them, if that's all right, um, and then open it up to, uh, to the panelists to, to respond. So one question is, is particularly for Charles Canot, and that is um, how will the House of Lords react to the possible passage of the Internal Markets Bill? That's question number one. Um, then turning to, and this is for, for any uh, of the panelists, um, question about the European Parliament. There has been talk in recent days about bypassing the Europe European Parliament if a deal is struck at the last minute, so long as EU member states provisionally consent to the deal. Is this right? And we'll take one more question. Um, would a potential deal on the future relationship have to go through the House of Commons and House of Lords? Is there any role at all for devolved administrations? So we have more questions, but we'll, we'll stop at those for the moment. And I think start with Charles and then, and then everyone else can pile in as, as they like. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed. I'll, I'll answer obviously the, the, uh, the first and the, the last of those, and I'd be very interested to hear about the second. Um, the IMB is back in the House of Lords on Wednesday, and uh, as you remember, the clauses which caused so much uh, pain and offence to uh, the uh, European Union are ones which the House of Lords had taken out, and I expect that as we speak, they are about to be put back into the bill and it will reappear in the House of Lords on Wednesday. And the House of Lords will then have to decide whether it wants to take them out again in this process called ping pong. And my own personal, given that they were taken out with a series of the largest ever majorities, for, well, not largest ever, but largest for 20 years majorities in the House of Lords, and given the tone of the debate and given where the various people in the House of Lords are, and given the government does not have a majority in the House of Lords, it's quite likely that the House of Lords on Wednesday will remove them again. And um, what one cannot really tell yet is, is what, what will happen with the ping pong process. Um, at, underlying the ping pong process is something called the Parliament Act, and the Parliament Acts take quite a long time, uh, arguably a year, to operate. So the ping pong can last a very long time if necessary. Parliament Acts are very, very rarely used. But I think we, the House of Lords does feel extremely strongly on these points and, um, and it feels it is the, 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 this, this is very much the sort of stuff that it really must stand firm on. Turning to the last uh, point, and obviously speaking as a Scot, um, I'm very, very sensitive to involving the devolved administrations in everything that goes on and keeping them updated. And I don't think that process has gone well at all in the last four and a half years. And, um, and we have written reports on the, on the very topic, and I've had countless meetings um, with all the people involved on that. Um, <clears throat> and um, it does have to, it will, I believe, come through both the House of Commons and the House of Lords in the form of primary legislation, and will go through at some pace, and um, it's possible for it to go through in another way, but it will certainly, I think, have to come to both houses one, well, it certainly will have to come to both houses one way or the other. Uh, and I don't think the devolved administrations will be uh, consulted anyway. There's not time. They will simply be told this is what's happening and this is our competence as Westminster and definitely like that. And there will be lots of complaints. Thank you. Thank you. Tom and David. Okay, two short remarks on my side. You, there was a question about the provisional application. I can be very outspoken here. The European Parliament is not a fan of provisional application 
at all. Uh, we discussed this last week in an internal round with committee chairs and representatives of the groups. And why is the European Parliament so critical of a provisional application? Because it would put the European Parliament in a very disadvantaged position. Parliament would have no control on the decision on provisional application. Council would be alone in essentially deciding about the factual entry into force and all related uh, conditions. In the end, the, parliament, the parliamentary participation would be a simple rubber stamp uh, exercise. It is especially our trade committee in the European Parliament, the so-called intercommittee, which has a standing practice that for major trade deals, the Commission never proposes provision application before the European Parliament has given its consent. And this has also been a clear commitment by Ursula von der Leyen as Commission President when she presented herself and her programme to the European Parliament. And for us, an agreement with the UK would fall exactly into that category. So to be very clear, provisional application is highly unpopular in the European Parliament. And the other point on the UK Internal Market Bill, here, uh, Tom and Charles, we in Brussels are following with great interest the ping pong uh, uh, game uh, between the House of Lords uh, and the Commons. Um, this is internal. I'm not in a position to comment on this, uh, but I want to make clear that the European Parliament has been very clear that there are certain highly contentious provisions that from our point of view violate the withdrawal agreement and they must be taken off the table for a possible agreement to be uh, ratified. Uh, reinserting these clauses would undermine a positive outcome of the negotiations and that's why we do hope that this can be solved but Having said that, I was just reading before we started this meeting um, the latest statement of the UK government on the uh, UK Internal Market Bill, and this statement I thought was rather positive uh, in wording that the UK government, I'm just looking for my documents here, uh, got so much paper. Uh, you've probably have followed it too. It was, a, it, it was presented just before the beginning of this meeting. If that is the way forward, then uh, this would be a positive step from our side. Okay. Um, just, I'm, I'm just going to let everyone know. I believe that Tom needs to leave shortly before seven. I think that that was the case. So just to exploit him a little bit more, I'm going to throw one more question in for Tom particularly and give him the floor at least so that he'll have a chance to respond. So in addition to... The previous questions, Tom, let me throw one more in for you perhaps, perhaps uh, in, in particular. So the question is, um, I would be interested in the panel's overview on what, in quotes, global Britain, unquote, really means in the medium term, particularly in respect of our place in the world, and as part of that, our relationship with the, U the EU. So over to you, Tom. Well, um, I'm delighted to say we recently published a report pretty much trying to answer this question in terms of uh, what our view of the integrated review is, and I'm sure you've seen it, Cheryl. Um, it, what, we, what we set out is, uh, I think, a, a, a series of options that the British government could take, which would change Britain's place in the world slightly from the last 40 years, but build on some of it. And we recommend, unsurprisingly, uh, uh, starting off with a firm footing in Europe and therefore uh, uh, a relationship that is at least uh, relatively stable. And this is my criticism of no deal is that it, it's not a thing. It's the absence of a thing. Uh, what we need actually is we need an agreement uh, with our European friends so that we have some stability at home and then we can expand abroad but i do think there's a, a a range of options in terms of building up alliances and partnerships around the world i mean it's certainly true that if you look at uh, the way in which the uk and japan the uk australia india and i can list a number of other countries are beginning to work more closely together there is a changing relationship that the uk has with uh, countries around the world and that that is something that does offer an opportunity uh, for a deeper relationship. But I, I think that that's, you know, 
that's a, that's an avenue for expansion, uh, which allows us to build on 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 the sort of traditions of the UK abroad, which is uh, effectively uh, the sort of regulatory environment, whether that's accountancy or you know trade law that we've provided uh, to so much of the world over the last two three hundred years. So let's see how how it progresses. But I do think there is an opportunity for the UK around the world. But I do think it also relies on having a firm relationship with our European partners. After all, uh, Britain's last adventure into globalism really started when we were cut off from the European mainland due, due to religious wars. This is somewhat different. Uh, but that's what took us to Turkey for the first time under Queen Elizabeth I and uh, later saw the expansion uh, around the world. So, you know, there is there is certainly an opportunity to, 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 to reach out to new places, but I do hope this time it's done in partnership with our friends nearer to home. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there was another, there was a question that came in, um, which I think has been touched on to some extent, but it was more specific to Germany. I'll add that in and then add one of my own. Um, and the question is, the UK's decision to leave the EU and reorient its foreign policy toward the Anglosphere is a clear slap in the face of European integration and Germany in particular. Is there any point in future cooperation beyond just friendly, neighborly relations? So that's one question. Um, the second, we haven't really discussed yet, and it, to some extent, when we are talking about global trade and globalization, um, it's definitely the elephant in the room, and that is China in the 21st century, and China's role vis-a-vis -vis the UK and vis-a-vis -vis the EU. Will this be some area where there's going to be cooperation or conflict? Tom, I'll turn back over to you. Can I, forgive me, because um, I know David will want to come on, on, on the German point as well, but could I come in very quickly on the German point? There, there is a, uh, a, a growing uh, relationship with the UK, uh, seeing itself as a more global and less European nation, but I, I'm not quite sure I'd go so far as to say that's simply Anglosphere. You know, I certainly wouldn't count Japan as part of the Anglosphere. Uh, and uh, on the question as to whether it's a slap in the face to Germany, I, I don't see it that way, actually. Uh, I think the relationship with Germany, funnily enough, is is one of the better relationships in the European continent uh, that, that we have. Um, and actually, the reality is that the relationship that many of us have with our German partners, and I have with my German partner, Norbert Röpgen, is, is to see the world in actually pretty similar ways. Um, yes, of course, it's true that Germany has uh, for very obvious geographic and historic uh, reasons much tighter alliances with its um, bordering countries than Britain does with them. Of course that's true, but uh, the relationship, the bilateral relationship between Britain and, and Germany is extremely strong. And by the way, you know, Germany is one of our closest intelligence partners in the world, not just in Europe, uh, and uh, certainly one of our most important defence partners. You know, it's, it, it's a very, very strong relationship with or without the European Union. And so I'm not quite sure that I would see the Anglosphere as a slap in the face to Germany. I think I, I certainly think it's, it, it raises questions about other relationships, but I wouldn't quite go there with that. Excellent, thank you. David, did you want to add to that? I feel like in all EU member states, but especially in Germany, the huge majority of people, and it's definitely the whole political establishment, uh, deeply regretted the outcome of the referendum in 2016 for a simple reason. A European Union with the United Kingdom is stronger than a European Union without the uh, United Kingdom, and the United Kingdom isn't any kind of country. We were we, then, we lost the third largest country, the second strongest economy, and together with France, the leading force on foreign affairs, security and defence. And despite the Brits always playing the bad cop, as the Americans would say, uh, in the last 15, 20 years of EU membership, often the British were also an important coalition and cooperation partner for Germany. Uh, the British were the driving force for getting trade agreements done. The British were 
And the British more or less invented the single market. They were the driving force to deepen the single market. The British were always at the front of fighting red tape and unnecessary bureaucracy. So there were many, many also positive input the United Kingdom gave to the European project. It's just, from our point of view, it was a pity about the last two major integration steps. They didn't go, uh, the joint currency and the uh, borderless Europe, as what we call as the Schengen Corporation. But anyhow, that's spilt milk. If you look at the political declaration signed by both sides last October, so this is exactly now 13 and a half months ago, it says in paragraph 78 and 79 that both sides envisage an ambitious, broad, deep and flexible partnership which goes way beyond trade and other thematic issues, but also on foreign policy, security and defence. May I add that I um, regret that until now, because the British side wasn't interested, um, foreign affairs, security and defence haven't played a role in the ongoing negotiations, negotiations on our future relations, but this might happen at a later, um, uh, at a later time. I definitely see the UK to continue to be an extremely important cooperation partner. By the way, I always talk of partnership with the United Kingdom, not relationship. It's more, it's a partnership. And I can't underline often enough that the UK isn't only a partner, the UK is also an important ally. We are still together in NATO, and I'm very sure that we will also now see um, a new impetus also for transatlantic relations in the framework of NATO after the 20th of January, uh, 2021 in the White House. Thank you, thank you. So I'll turn it over to Charles in just a moment. I, I hear from Maurice that, that Tom it needs to leave at 10 till, which it's, it's actually eight till by my clock right now. So I just want to express my thanks and thanks on behalf of, I think the whole LSE uh, German society. Thank you so much for your time and we'll, we'll let you um, take off. <laughs> thank, thank you very much indeed. It is a pleasure to be here with David and Charles and, and you Cheryl and to the whole of the LSE German society. Thank you very much for inviting me on this auspicious evening. Tom. Tom, before you go, I just saw what Ursula von der Leyen tweeted just this minute. Uh, with Boris Johnson, we took stock of the negotiations. The conditions for an agreement are not there due to remaining differences on critical issues. We asked our chief negotiators to prepare an overview of the remaining differences to be discussed in person in the coming days. So, in the coming days. That's not no. That's no, it's not no. a no, but uh, we're still not quite there yet. They should have left it to us, David. We'd have sorted it. <laughs> yeah, we should have included Charles. <laughs> Thank you very much. Absolutely. How about Thank you, Charles? Yeah. Bye, Tom. <laughs> Bye, Tom. Bye, Tom. Thank you very much. Charles? Yes, I was just going to come back on the issue of... Um, of I mean, I, my, everything that I see in here tells me that actually the relationship between, much as, as Tom was saying, Germany and the UK is on a bilateral basis, really close. And there are lots of, there are lots of reasons for me having developed that belief. And um, I, I think it will be built out um, after all of this is over because there's a determination, I think, on both sides uh, to do that. I, 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 I think I see that. And I've seen it multiple times and over a long period of time. And I would note that there has, there is between, of course, France and Germany, the Elysee and Aachen, uh, treaties which uh, provide for a lot of very close uh, working um, uh, of the two countries. Between ourselves and France there is the, uh, the Lancaster House Agreement which was 10 years old in October and has been a great success and is being built out further and I hope that we will get into the position where the bilateral uh, side with Germany uh, reflects that. And that's I think, I mean, uh, uh, more and more as we work together with the Germans, um, I think we we discover we have so much in common uh, about the way we look at problems and the way we wish to try and address them. And I think that this discovery was made largely because of the, of the sudden uh, resignation of leadership by the USA um, in um, sort of global affairs. I, I think that's going to um, come back and they say 
pretty quickly because um, all ran, but it, it meant that there was a discovery um, between the UK and Germany. I just, I mean, I just wanted to push back on that. I don't think there's any intent to slap in the face, nor has there been a slap in the face for, for Germany. Thank you, thank you. So my understanding is that we're due to end at uh, seven o'clock. So I'm going to just squeeze in a couple more questions if we can do that, uh, if that's all right. So one specifically, I believe we have a student who's signed in from New York uh, and has asked, uh, what effect do you think that the Biden administration will have on shaping EU and British affairs? And there is, let's see, oh, and one more, okay, I'm going to squeeze in three questions if that's all right. Um, the second one is, do you think that the UK will not only go a more individual way in Europe in terms of trade, but also in defense? That is, will the relationship with NATO worsen in any way after Brexit? And the third question has to do with Northern Ireland. How likely is the session of Northern Ireland and Scotland in the next decade? And what would either or both mean for what remains of the UK in terms of its place in the world and its relationship with the EU. David, do you want to kick off? Okay, well, I'll kick off with the, um, with the Biden administration. Um, I think what we will see is a fresh start in transatlantic relations between the European Union and the United States. Mm. And uh, but I would say the European Union plus other important European allies like the United Kingdom or Norway, um, who are also uh, in NATO uh, allies, um, things can only get better in transatlantic relations after uh, all the hiccups we've seen uh, since 2017. I grew up in West Berlin as the son of a British uh, military serviceman and a German wife and my childhood I spent with the, the French, the American and the British allies defending the liberty and freedom of West Berlin and the whole Western world. And I am a rock solid supporter of transatlantic cooperation. Never ever would I have dreamt that a US president would name the European Union in one row with China and Russia as a foe. And that was that is so shocking for people who grew up in the 70s and so strongly believe in transatlantic relations. So things can only get better. Why could Biden also be helpful dealing with the United Kingdom? Well, there's one point. Unlike the uh, president who's still in office, the president elect made very clear that he pays attention to the withdrawal agreement. He pays attention to the Good Friday Agreement and he pays attention to the, as, to the matter that under no circumstances a hard border between, the Nor between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland uh, should be created again. And that's why he was outspoken and very critical of the UK Internal Market Bill and said as long as there's any threat to the uh, Good Friday Belfast Agreement, uh, there wouldn't be a trade agreement between the United States and the United Kingdom. So here Joe Biden is taking a similar view to the one we take in the European Union that we just believe that this that certain clauses of this UK internal market bill are highly problematic. On defense the European Union is a trade organization at the core of the European Union is the single market but in recent years we've added other areas of cooperation we're still at the beginning of closer defense cooperation. And to be honest, we've probably, the steps we've made in the last three, four years are also due to the British since 2016 saying, okay, we still don't believe in defense cooperation at an EU level, but we will no longer block this. We have said as the European Union that we would invite the United Kingdom to participate in European defense projects, for instance, the European Defense Fund, that they are uh, invited to participate in PESCO projects and the permanent structured cooperation or to participate in EU military operations. But to be honest, the interest on the British side until now hasn't been that big, to put it in very diplomatic terms, but the offer is still there. 
but in the framework of NATO, our cooperation will continue. It might even increase. The British membership of NATO has nothing to do with the UK leaving the European Union. And on Northern Ireland and Scotland, I wouldn't dare uh, to comment. That's domestic British politics. And uh, I'll leave that to, to, to uh, Charles uh, Kinnell. Well, thank you, David. And um, as ever, um, you speak so much um, utter sense. Um, it's uh, common sense, of course, is a, is a rotten way of expressing it because it's completely not common. But um, <laughs> um, I, I was, wasn't really going to add very much on, on Joe Biden, but he's actually very well known our, because everyone's so old in the House of Lords. On our committee, we have a number of people who know Joe Biden quite well and knew him as a senator and knew him as a vice president. And he was very internationalist in both those roles and took a huge interest in what was going on Firth of America. And uh, I'm sure, therefore, he will take a huge interest in what's going on Firth of America um, as president. Um, it would be unnatural if he didn't. Uh, and I think that's actually um, to our, our, our advantage um, and uh, that he will be interested in things and where EU wants support from America, I'm sure that in something or in some way he's at least a sympathetic ear, um, uh, which I'm afraid that, that hasn't been the case in the recent times. Um, in terms of um, uh, and defence isn't really my area, but there is of course a small amount of defence inside the European Union Committee because all the defence that they were just talking about were things that we had to consider. But uh, I do note as purely as a citizen that actually NATO is very well thought of in Britain and and with many colleagues who've been in the armed services um, they all like NATO and I, I can't see the UK doing anything more than being utterly supportive of NATO for the foreseeable future and the good news is that actually Americans I think will be back. I think the real concern was that um, there's much less interest in NATO <coughs> Um, under under Trump than there will be under Biden. Um, turning to the very painful subject of the potential breakup of the United Kingdom, um, 10 years is luckily a very long time for the crystal ball. Uh, and I think it's really very simple. And that is that if economic times are good, a breakup is much less likely. And if economic times are really rocky and bad, a breakup is more likely. And um, so that's why actually uh, the, the having of a deal in the next 72 hours or whatever it is, which I think will great, greatly stabilize everything economically and we can all get back to doing normal things again, uh, would uh, in the end uh, mean that a lot of these rumbles would, would, would quieten down. If on the other hand, we didn't have a deal, there obviously is a, is a risk that the economies concerned uh, could be impacted and that I'm afraid will only add fuel to the nationalist fire um, mm. that uh, is around in both his countries. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you on that very poignant remark. David, did you want to add any last no, remarks? No, I was no. saying that was great. Yeah, that, was, that, was, that was quite, that's, that was quite a finale, I have to say, uh, Charles. Um, so I think it's just left to me to thank you both, David McAllister and Charles Canole. And although Tom Tuganat had to leave early, my thanks once again to him. And certainly thanks to the LSE uh, German Society for organizing this event and for all the participants, over 100 participants out there. Thank you all for uh, joining us this evening and for asking questions and participating. So on that, we'll sign off. And I wish you all a, a good evening and fingers crossed, you know. And let me, say, let me say to all the Germans participating, vielen Dank, einen schönen Abend. Und wir werden dafür sorgen, dass auch künftig das Vereinigte Königreich eng mit der Europäischen Union zusammenarbeitet, insbesondere mit Blick auf Erasmus Plus, Horizon und andere Austausch- und Forschungsprogramme. Wir tun unser Bestes und versuchen, die deutsch-britischen akademischen Beziehungen auch hier zu stärken. So that was my block in German. Thank you. Thank very you good. Very much. And, I, and I say thank you for my part very much indeed um, for, for organizing this and um, for getting it going. Excellent. All right. Well, with that, uh, Morris, did you have anything further to, to yes, say? I, I, just, 
I, I just uh, wanted to say that um, we are also looking forward to welcome you um, as uh, to the um, LSE German Symposium, which will be able to register from next week onwards. We will continue the debate on British uh, European affairs with Tony Blair, uh, Heiko Maas and others. And uh, yes, we're looking forward to um, welcoming you, you all back to our future events. And on that note, uh, yes, thank you to all the participants tonight. Excellent. All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. And good goodbye, Dave. Bye, Joel. Nice to see you. Very good. Thank you, Harold. Bye. Thank you, Harold. Bye.